this week on the show. A centenary fit for a pharaoh. This is very exciting because I have been given permission to actually go down these steps to ground level and get a closer look. The Christmas tradition that'll scare the stockings off you. Aber wenn du jetzt mal so sehr brav bist in das ganze Jahr, dann brauchst du keine Angst haben von Krampus. And why Glaswegian panto crowds are not to be messed with. If the act on that stage was not good enough, believe me, they knew about it. Egypt's Valley of the Kings, perhaps the most famous archaeological site in the world. And this has been a landmark year at the burial chamber many people make a beeline for. Exactly a hundred years ago, the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun was discovered underneath the desert close to the town of Luxor. The team had been digging for years and were right on the verge of giving up when the top of a set of ancient steps appeared in the sand. And lo and behold, this is what they saw. I mean, look at it. Incredible. Absolutely astonishing. And when the archaeologists did come down here, they didn't just find his remains, they found ornaments, jewellery, paintings, bits of chariots, trumpets, perfume and even wine. Tutankhamun wasn't the most influential or best known of the pharaohs and his tomb isn't the biggest or the most spectacular. But the find was a sensation in 1922 and made headlines around the world. Now then, this is very exciting because I have been given permission to actually go down these steps to ground level and get a closer look. This mural is incredible. It actually depicts the afterlife of Tutankhamun. It's incredible that it's all so well preserved. I mean, it looks astonishing. I did, I'm not going to touch it, but wow. For this corner of Egypt, the discovery meant more treasure in the form of tourism and the sales opportunities that came with it. Mo Salah, the Liverpool football player. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Are you sure it's here? No, <laughs> thank you. No, I have the rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> A century on and souvenirs in his image still bring in the money. Thank you very much, Shukran. Greece, Greece. Greece, no. From where? From London. London. More, Greece. you have Tutankhamun here. Look, 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 more. Look, so much Tutankhamun. Wow. Battle the 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 man, but keep two the da. The one Pharaoh, the one Ahramat, the one Fertiti, the one Belsatak, the one Khayami. All the man, but take from me. The two ta, the guy I have. The man, but take from me. All the man, but take. It's been a landmark year for Egypt's antiquities, with new and restored discoveries opening, and a huge glittering parade as the mummies of 22 pharaohs were moved to their new home, the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. Also newly opened after restoration work is the home of the man widely credited with finding Tutankhamun's burial chamber, Howard Carter. However, many say the Egyptian contribution to all this has been overlooked. And I'm on my way to hear some of that story and meet a family very well known in these parts, but sadly not outside this country. So it's interesting with the two sides of the Nile, I've just come from the east side, which is where all the shops and life bustles are and people live there and stuff. But I'm heading now back to the emptier, less developed west side, 
where you'll find the tombs and burial chambers of the Valley of the Kings. And they call that the side of the dead. The Abdul Rasul family run a cafe these days, but generations of them have farmed along the banks of the Nile, and as such, have an intimate knowledge of what lies on and underneath the dust and sand. So this is the 12-year-old boy that they said really discovered the tomb. Nubi claims it was actually his father who first found the tomb of Tutankhamun. Ahmed Abdul Rasul was just a child at the time. Now, Egyptian perspectives like these are being acknowledged more widely, and one of the ways that's happening is by huge landmark public projects. Like the brand new Grand Egyptian Museum, due to open in 2023, and it'll be the largest archaeological museum complex in the world. And this too, the Avenue of the Sphinx, buried under sand for hundreds of years and last year opened to the public for the first time. It runs from Luxor Temple to here, the magnificent complex of Karnak. What do you think about yeah, the fact that it's so crowded? It is, it is so crowded. It, it's extremely crowded. I, I have to tell you something. This is the busiest that it could have got in ancient Egypt because the actual people, the ordinary people, were not allowed in the They temple. were not allowed here. This was an exclusive area. It's only for the priests, only for the members of the royal court, only for the selected few. The ordinary people, just like ourselves, would have never had any glimpse of the inside of the temple. Heber is an amazing storyteller, but ask her about the story of the Abdul Rasuls and who really discovered the tomb, and she believes there's a wider issue. I think to focus on this is to miss the point. The whole point is the contribution that the whole Abdul Rasul family and the many Egyptian families who were involved in the archaeological excavations, without whom Howard and many of the foreign excavators would have not managed to make any of these discoveries altogether. And this is kind of connected to how Egyptians are portrayed in, in this world of archaeology. We're not even portrayed, we're, to we're totally written out. We're written out from the whole process of knowledge production. Whenever it's an Egyptian, uh, he would have stumbled on a step, as you said, or he'd been stumbling riding a donkey, etc. It could never be out of real knowledge. It has to be a mistake. While the Egyptians clearly played a huge part in the discovery, the persistence of Howard Carter and the money of his wealthy aristocratic backer were also vitally important to the success. Now the desire is for both parts of that story to be recognised and told. All these tourists here, all the people yeah. who are here, what, yeah. what do you think they believe? Do you think they still believe the old version or do you think we're grand they're gradually being told something which is more in tune with what you think? No, I think they carry the same old beliefs because all of their programmes would only focus on ancient Egypt. Nothing on the many other layers of Egyptian heritage. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that the whole, what brought them in here is this colonial narrative. It's not the narrative that we need to reshape. Are you at least hopeful in the future that might change, that, that small children across the world will get a better understanding of all this? Yes, I hope so. I hope so. And this can only come when acknowledging the colonial history that made ancient Egypt the way it is imagined today. We need to acknowledge this first and then move on from there. For the rest of his life, Ahmed Abdel Rasul told visitors to Luxor about his adventures with Howard Carter, an account, like so many others, rarely told in the West.
But what's good is that the Egyptians are now reclaiming their story and the rest of us are beginning to take notice. Well away from the big archaeological sites, there are a whole bundle of things to do in Egypt and here are some of the highlights. For beach breaks, the Red Sea coast's got a string of well-developed resort towns that have been popular for years. Sharm el Sheikh's probably the best known, especially after recently hosting the COP climate talks. For something quieter though, you could try Makadi Bay near Hugada. Long white sandy beaches without the crowds and clubbers. The whole stretch of coastline has crystal clear seas and thriving coral reefs, so divers love it. Turtles, spinner dolphins, manta rays and dugongs are the big stars here. One of the other highlights is the sunken British cargo steamship SS Thistledown. Hit by German bombers in 1941, 200 divers a day now explore the wreck near the town of Ras Mohammed. The holy month of Ramadan begins in March next year. During the day, it might mean shorter opening hours and disrupted transport. However, iftar, the breaking of the fast at sunset, means loads happening in the evenings. Hotels will lay out entertainment, but the real celebrations are around the neighbourhood iftar tables laid out on the street. You'll need a local to invite you, but this is where the party is. Still to come on The Travel Show. The other Christmas visitor that could come knocking this December and this one's not quite so jolly. And the Glasgow theatre tradition you need nerves of steel to take part in. You had men in the back of the auditorium throwing shipyard rivets, nails, punches, screws. So don't go away. This week I'm exploring some of Egypt's most famous antiquities and I thought it might be worth lingering a little at Karnak Temple. At its peak, around three and a half to four thousand years ago, this was the largest and most important religious complex in ancient Egypt. And Heber's description of some of the detail here has me hooked. You were talking about obelisks. Yeah. And that is a very, very tall one. It is, it is. And this takes us to God Ra, the god of the sun, again one of the most important gods and that's how you would see the pyramidian shape at the end of the obelisks. That's your way to the sky where you get to join God Ra up in the sky and come back again. Just the sheer feat of creating that of high yes. a structure yes, of and then doing all the engravings on the side. Is that appreciated enough as to what people were I actually doing? I don't think doing? it is. I don't think it is. We tend to appreciate the beauty, but not the labor, yeah. not the hard work that went into bringing something like this, not only up, but the carving, the making, uh, the carving of the actual stone to, be, to take the shape of an obelisk and then moving it all the way uh, to here from a swan. So it came from a swan down the yes, river, right? Yes, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, and what about the, this, this, the little the, the, here? Yes, what, what's the all this? Yes, it says like the strong bull discussing how the king is Horus and to exemplify how he's got huge or great physical features that he is equated to the bull, being as, as strong as a bull. This was also one of the most important titles that any ancient Egyptian king would have had to acquire. The complex opens from six in the morning. And now mass tourism's back with us once again, it's worth attempting to avoid the crowds and the heat by arriving early. To Tyrol in Austria next, which is right in the middle of a busy Christmas run-up. But in that part of the world, Santa Claus isn't the only one who comes knocking. Krampus is part goat, and part devil, and his job is to punish naughty children. Masks of his face are made by craftspeople like Norbert. Ungefähr eine Woche bist du unterwegs. Bist relativ viel Arbeit. Ich weiß Handarbeit. Umso natürlicher die Maske wird, umso schöner ist die Maske. Da muss aber wieder einen neuen schönen Gesichtsaufzug haben. Das ist das Problem bei der Maske. 
1. Dezember das ist Krampuszeit. Der Nikolaus bringt Süßigkeiten und der Krampus vertreibt eigentlich böse. Aber wenn du jetzt mal so sehr brav bist in das ganze Jahr, dann brauchst du keine Angst haben vom Krampus. Aber wenn du ein schlechtes Gefühl hast, du warst nicht sehr brav in deinem Leben. Krampus is an ancient pagan character. But when Christianity spread throughout Europe, he became part of the Christmas tradition, despite opposition from the Catholic Church. This is an old heidnish Brauch. This is, I would say, 17th, 16th century. Almost in every community, big Krampus umzüge. So, the Krampus mask, I would say, from the top of the roof and the wand, or from me, and then the clock on the top, and there will be a big Umzüge. Festig feiert. Gibt es zum Essen, Trinken und halt jeder möchte die Schönste haben. Das ist schon fast ein bisschen modischer. Wenn es kalt ist und du hast ein schönes Fell im Rücken, dann ist es schön warm. Ne? Es gibt auch gute Sachen bei Campus. Ja, man muss ein bisschen Künstler sein. Da brauchst du ein bisschen Vorstellung. Wenn du solche schöne Maske hast, oder? Was schön? Oder schöne Hörner, das ist Machtsymbol. Wenn du jetzt großes Steinbock hast, da so groß. Da hast du, siehst du schon von weit, musst du sagen, ah, das ist gut, Kapitalist. Wenn du so kleine hast wie diese, dann ist auch immer Maskenschnitzer. <lacht> Now, with the festive season well underway, there's one British pastime that keeps the flights burning bright during those long winter nights. And that's the Christmas panto. <laughs> Catmo has more. We're in Glasgow, where Scotland's premium pantomime dame is treading the boards in her 25th panto season. <laughs> It's basically a good night out, which is the most important thing, or a good afternoon out, full of laughs and joy, eh, sort of hitched on to a traditional fairy tale love story. It's usually kids' first experience of theatre. So we're, we're the sort of gateway, <laughs> if you like. There's hundreds of years of tradition in Panto, from audience participation... Those gullible fools I believe in, and I tell them, oh yes they will. Oh, yes, they will! To a host of stock characters. Panto Dame was generally a man dressed as a woman. And that allowed uh, men to come out and do really outrageous impersonations of women. It's quite unusual to be a woman playing it. I'm one of very few allowed to. Um, maybe in the past women have been forced into being the more glamorous type. And my thing is it's not about whether you're a man or woman, it's the type of performer you are. If you can break through and uh, the, to the audience and say, I'm about to make a fool of myself here, come with me. Can I find a petrol station? Waiting up wandering through this barren, desolate wasteland. Oh my, was that? I think it was Paisley. <laughs> It's a great quote by a wonderful panto performer, Jerry Kelly, who I worked with here many times. Pantomime is a celebration of local culture. You said it, something like, we've set this in Clydeside, which is, you know, obviously Glasgow, but making it local, having all those references in it, and making it of the place that generally the audience are from. It's a big business across the UK. Pre-pandemic theatres sold around three million panto tickets a year and Glasgow has a special affection for it. Among the dozens of venues staging a production is this wee treasure hidden above an amusement arcade. You're in the Britannia Panopticon Music Hall. It's the oldest surviving original music hall in the world. Music halls are basically places where the working classes used to go when they finished their working day to be entertained by dancers, singers, novelty acts, contortionists, high wire acts, you name it. You know, music halls were one of the places where you would see a pantomime. Pantomime was the only sort of theatre that was like variety. 
all in the one production. Glasgow has a long-standing theatre tradition. A recent poll found it was one of the British cities with the most theatres outside London. And back when the Panopticon opened in the 1850s, working-class Glaswegian audiences were already developing a bit of a reputation. Stanley Baxter actually wrote about the music hall in his own bedside book and he actually said that they left no turn unstoned. They had spent money to get in here. If the act on that stage was not good enough, believe me, they knew about it. Boys used to urinate from the front of the balcony onto the stage to hit the act on the stage below. You had men in the back of the auditorium throwing shipyard rivets, nails, punches, screws. They became popular with the famous acts because if they could get away with it on the stages in Glasgow, they could get away with their routine anywhere in the world. Luckily, things have quietened down a bit since then. But Glasgow audiences are still a famously lively bunch. For me, if I was going to go and see Panto, I'd come here because of the audience. Uh, in Glasgow, there is a great tradition of audiences joining in. Sometimes, whether you want or not, they might I do question myself, why am I keeping doing it? I'm a granny now, I'm 64. Why would you go out? So for me, it allows me to walk in the light and push the light out. It gives people a good night out. It's a great leveller as well because you've got, you've got people who work for the government and you've got people who are, uh, who are cleaners. They're all experiencing the same thing. And there are so few places we can go now where you know, 2,000 people can gather. So to be part of that still after all the, these years, makes it all worth it. Right, sadly, that's us done here in Luxor, but join me next week when we look back at the best bits of 2022 on The Travel Show, a year when we can finally say we hit the road again. And what a year it's been. If you want another chance to see Addy on a roll with some Italian cheese, Carolus's human-powered odyssey along Sri Lanka's canal network, or even my very special night in the home of a boyhood hero, do give us a watch in a week's time. Yeah.